Hi everyone, I'm Julie Fleshman, President and CEO of PanCan. I'm so happy to be with all of you today. Today we plan to talk about COVID-19 and the impact it's had on patients and families. This last year has been a particularly challenging time for everyone, but especially for those people facing pancreatic cancer. Over the next hour, we're gonna engage in a discussion with experts about COVID-19 and pancreatic cancer, the vaccines, and the vaccine as it relates to patients with pancreatic cancer. And I'm so thrilled today to be joined by three experts who are gonna help us engage in this discussion and provide you this important information. First, Dr. Anne-Marie Dulidge, who is PanCan's Chief Medical Officer. She is responsible for all of PanCan's clinical initiatives, including PanCan's Precision Promise clinical trial. Her expertise is in hematology, immunology, and infectious diseases. Next, Dr. Nipun Merchant is the Chief Surgical Officer and the Interim Associate Director of Translational Research at the University of Miami Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center. Dr. Merchant is a member of PanCan Scientific and Medical Advisory Board. And finally, we're joined by Dr. Eileen O'Reilly, an oncologist and director of medical initiatives at the David Rubenstein Center for the Pancreatic Cancer Research and Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Dr. O'Reilly is also a member of PanCan Scientific and Medical Advisory Board. Thank you to the three of you for joining us today. We're gonna do our very best to answer all of your questions. But in case we don't get to your question, one of PanCan's case managers will follow up with you to provide the information that you're requesting. Our case managers are trained and are available to you throughout the Monday through Friday from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. Pacific time to take your questions. So I hope you take advantage of this free service that is available to all of you. Before we begin, I wanna tell you a little bit about PanCan. Our approach to fighting pancreatic cancer is a comprehensive approach. We're funding research and clinical initiative. That includes research grants that go to institutions all across the country, a clinical trial called Precision Promise that PanCan is sponsoring, and an early detection initiative. We also do government advocacy work in Washington, D.C. to increase the federal resources that are available to pancreatic cancer researchers. I talked about our amazing patient services program available to you to call and talk to a trained case manager and get comprehensive information about the disease. Through that patient services program, we also offer webinars like you're attending today. And finally, our community engagement program encompasses our volunteer network across the country. 60 volunteer affiliates that are helping us to raise awareness and visibility about PanCan and pancreatic cancer and raise funds to help us drive our mission forward. I encourage you to go to our website at pancan.org to learn more and learn how you can get involved. Before we jump in, I wanna take a moment to thank our generous scientific and medical affairs industry members, AbbVie, AstraZeneca, Fibrogen, Ipsen, Pfizer, Raphael Pharmaceuticals, Tempest, and Time. I also wanna give a special thank you to our webinar sponsor, Ipsen Biopharmaceuticals. So let's dive into our questions. Dr. O'Reilly, it's been about a year now since the pandemic started. What do we know now today about COVID-19 and pancreatic cancer? So thanks, Julie. I think this is a very important question. It's almost a year, as you said, since uh, the onset of a big change in everybody's life, and in particular for people with cancer and how it's impacted uh, their well-being, their approach to care, and the management of COVID-19. So I would say that we've learned a lot about the diagnosis of COVID-19. We've learned a lot about uh, management of the disease in the hospital, and we're now moving to a prevention approach with vaccines. And during this period of time, there's been uh, some 
distinct uh, understandings of how we approach care of patients, not just with pancreas cancer, but with any uh, malignancy. And we think about it for those who are in active treatment, for those who are in follow-up treatment, and for those who are just approaching a diagnosis of cancer that may not be as yet defined. So initially, almost everything was on pause, and that was, uh, I think, an extremely difficult time. As the year has evolved, we've learned how to look after patients, how to integrate optimal treatments and continue care going, and in particular, continue uh, clinical trials, which were understandably paused, and a lot of diagnostic uh, screening interventions, even some treatment approaches were in a way simplified to adapt uh, to the circumstances of the pandemic. But now, I would say in, in most places, uh, patients, I, I trust and hope, are receiving access to care and receiving optimal care adapted uh, to the circumstances of the pandemic and uh, addressing the constraints in terms of social distancing uh, for patients who become COVID positive, being quarantined and isolated, and uh, staff and families respecting that they can't always be all together in the one room and integrating uh, aspects of telemedicine and other considerations. So it's been a huge learning experience. I, I think many, many positives will come from this, even though a lot of sadness uh, as well. Uh, but I, I do think there'll be some very important developments for how we approach care uh, for people with this cancer and other cancers. Yes, great, Dr. O'Reilly. I think that's absolutely true. And telemedicine, which you hit on, is certainly one aspect um, that could be very positive um, for patients when that is appropriate. So is there anything specific that you have had to do differently in your management of patients with pancreatic cancer in the last year? Yes, I think at the peak of the pandemic, when things were very, very active, we were making some adjustments to treatment. So for example, for people who were in routine follow-up, we were deferring uh, visits and deferring imaging until uh, circumstances eased. For patients who needed uh, surgery, again, when, when things were in a very difficult phase, we were moving to more neoadjuvant therapy for that uh, particular period of time. And where a person was stabilized on treatment, perhaps adding in an extra week of treatment or using an oral maintenance approach or adding in growth factors to try to minimize uh, periods of time in the hospital related to low blood counts and risk of infection. So those were considerations that were adapted. Uh, we were minimizing uh, procedures for a period of time just for safety uh, for all as we all learned to, to adapt. But I do think for the most part, now uh, those temporary measures have been displaced uh, for uh, trying to proceed as per guidelines and as per optimal care and getting clinical trials and that process underway again. That's, I would say, majorly scaled up once more in the last six months. Great. Yeah, it's really um, terrific to hear that um, physicians have been able to adapt to this time, um, and especially clinical trials, as you mentioned, um, which are so important for pancreatic cancer patients to be able to consider. So, Dr. Merchant, um, as a surgeon, how is the pandemic affecting surgery for pancreatic cancer? Yeah, hi. Thank you, uh, Julie. So, you know, just to kind of expand a little bit on what Dr. Morali was mentioning. So, when the pandemic hit at the first stage, about a year ago, last March. Um, obviously, uh, the entire country shut down. We were mandated um, as a federal mandate to stop all elective surgeries at that time. And uh, we kept things going only for emergent situations. Um, so during that time, you know, the question becomes, well, is cancer surgery really an emergent surgery or can it, can it be delayed? Um, so we took things on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, clearly, we significantly decreased the number of cases we were doing. But as Dr. O'Reilly was mentioning, um, 
if patients, particularly patients with pancreatic cancer, if they could get neoadjuvant therapy, we tried to do that. Sometimes we extended the amount of time they were on neoadjuvant therapy, especially if they were responding well to their treatment so as to delay um, you know, the timing of their surgery. Obviously, at that time, we didn't know what the full implications uh, of this pandemic were. Everybody was afraid uh, you know, to even come into the hospital, including frontline healthcare workers. Um, however, the important point was that um, very quickly, all hospitals, all healthcare systems developed uh, a very robust infrastructure for testing capabilities, as well as a uh, robust infrastructure to take care of these patients uh, very well. Isolated uh, areas within the emergency rooms and the floors and the ICUs. Uh, and as we did that, uh, and as we developed even operating rooms, which were separately isolated for COVID positive patients that needed surgery, uh, we began to increase the number of procedures that were being done. And uh, I would tell you that after the first couple months of the pandemic, uh, we almost uh, pretty much came back to our normal volumes of surgery because of this um, extensive infrastructure that was set up for testing and treating. Uh, and then even when we had these second surges in July and August, as well as during the holidays recently, um, because of that, we were able to maintain the volumes of surgeries that we're doing. Yeah, that's really terrific to hear. So, you know, today we're hearing a lot about these new strains of the coronavirus. Um, what does that mean for patients today? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I think it has uh, increased a little bit of anxiety around this um, a little bit. Um, so we've heard of the UK strain was the first kind of variant that we heard about um, that developed, obviously, in the uh, United Kingdom, but was seen first here in the United States in December of 2020. Um, actually, that strain uh, seems to be uh, more rapidly spreading, and there's some um, suggestion that it be the you know, more aggressive strain. Um, and modeling that's been done by the CDC now because of the increase in rapid spread of this strain um, is suggesting that in this country within the next two or three months, it may be the dominant strain uh, of COVID-19. Um, the other strain that we've heard about is the South African variant. Um, we've heard a little bit less about it, but it's also now been detected in this country as of January. Uh, and then there's also a, a Brazilian strain um, that's been identified. Um, these strains all seem to have more uh, ease of uh, spread. Uh, and then there's some question as to whether um, they produce more uh, exacerbated disease and symptoms. Uh, however, that still needs to be uh, tested longer term. I think importantly, what seems to be emerging is at least for the uh, UK strain, uh, it seems to be still susceptible to the vaccines that are uh, uh, being distributed now. Uh, it's still unclear about the Brazilian and the South African strain, uh, but it's something that we'll have to see as time goes by. It's just too early to tell. And I guess you would, you know, advise patients, they just need to continue to wear their masks, social distance. Um, is, there, is there any other advice? No, I think these are the most important things uh, you can do. Uh, there are clear, clear evidence that uh, this would decrease the uh, risk of spread as well as uh, your risk of um, getting the, um, um, the, the virus. Um, you know, wearing masks, social distancing, avoiding um, poorly ventilated areas, um, you know, the routine things that we've heard about so much over the last year are, are, are clearly very effective and should be followed, including frequent hand hygiene. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, so Dr. O'Reilly, if a pancreatic cancer patient is having COVID-19 symptoms, what should they do? Well, thank you, Julie. This is a very important practical question and, and a common one. So just a reminder here, the the symptoms of COVID-19 could be a fever, could be a cough, could be shortness of breath, and some unique uh, symptoms that we've all learned over the last year of loss of sense of smell or taste. So any of these uh, prompt uh, consideration for calling their healthcare team and undergoing testing. And just a point or two on testing, there are 
two main tests that are done. There's the rapid antigen test that will give a result in 15 minutes to an hour. But these have some limitations, uh, in particular, what we call false negatives, meaning you get an answer that it's negative test, but in fact, uh, the virus is present. And so the, the gold standard is PCR testing, which can be done overnight or 12 to 24 hours to a couple of days, depending on uh, the testing uh, availability in a particular setting. And in, in that context, if there's a suspicion there, we, we want patients, one, to sort of isolate at home. And as was already mentioned by uh, Dr. Merchant, to make sure they're uh, utilizing all of the uh, guidance from the CDC in terms of mask, in terms of distance, in terms of hand washing and separate you know, utilities, et cetera, at home. So following a diagnosis, their healthcare team will educate regarding symptoms to monitor for so worsening symptoms, worsening fevers, feeling more fatigued, getting sharpness of breath, even measuring the oxygen levels. So everybody knows these days what a pulse oximeter is. A little clip you put on your finger and gives you a, a real-time assessment of your oxygen levels. And there's a lot of innovation that's gone on utilizing technology and, uh, and levering, leveraging systems infrastructures. So, for example, uh, we here in New York have a, a COVID-19 uh, cohort monitoring approach where any patient who's positive will be accessed via the patient portal and asked to fill out a, a daily symptom update and the red flag warnings that trigger uh, an in-person telephone, not an in-person, but a telephone or triage assessment of those symptoms. Uh, and initially, and this, this is an, another important point, at the beginning of the pandemic, the, there was huge fear, right? And nobody wants to come to hospitals or healthcare settings. But now there are some real therapeutics that, that don't cure the illness, but decrease the severity, decrease the risk of ending up in intensive care. So we do want to know if patients' symptoms are getting worse and have the opportunity to intervene sooner rather than later. And I think that's an important message that we've learned uh, over the last eight to nine months. So typically we will suspend anti-cancer treatments for a short period of time until symptoms have re completely resolved. And uh, usually that's a period now of around two to three weeks depending on whether a person was symptomatic or not, longer if uh, they were symptomatic. And again, this is evolving, and as are the guidelines of whether or not to retest uh, afterwards, because we know that because of immune suppression with treatments, tests may remain positive for longer, but patients are not truly infected to others. And, and again, this is an area of blocks. Great. Yeah, thank you. That was a great overview of testing um, to remind patients um, the importance of testing when, they're, when they are having symptoms and then what, um, how that, the, the COVID-19 will be, will be treated and how it impacts their pancreatic cancer. So let's move on to talking about vaccines. Um, I think, you know, there's been some pretty exciting news. We now have two vaccines that have been approved for emergency use by the FDA, Pfizer and Moderna. And now today, over 150 million people have been vaccinated um, worldwide. So I want to turn to Dr. Dulij, um, who is PanCan's chief medical officer, but also an immunologist. So Dr. Dulij, what goes into developing a vaccine and how are the COVID-19 vaccines developed so quickly while still ensuring they are safe for patients? Yeah, thank you, uh, Julie. Um, vaccine development is a very long and complex process. And usually it takes years, if not decades, to be able to come with a vaccine from the genetic identification of the virus, the understanding of which part of the virus is important for infection, then a series of tests in vitro, then in animal testing, and then the long years of, anim of uh, experiments in healthy volunteers, which are called clinical trials. And then finally, the review by the FDA and the possible approval 
of, of a vaccine and its deployment to the general population. And it is quite remarkable that this was reduced to 11 months for the COVID vaccines. And there are several reasons for that. Primarily, the field of vaccinology has benefited from decades of intense progress, uh, whether it's about malaria, HIV, Ebola uh, vaccines. Second, the novel technology, this mRNA technology, allows to produce a vaccine without having to culture the virus in eggs or in some cell lines. Um, third, there were unprecedented resources and creativity that were applied on all fronts. Research at the NIH, research in academic institutions, of course, you know, an enormous effort on the part of pharmaceutical companies and substantial resources devoted there. And finally, an exceptional collaboration with the FDA, which you know, went with a lot of creative ways to conduct research more rapidly. I would say last but not least, an intense international collaboration. So the safety of these two vaccines have been established in large trials of approximately 30 to 40,000 healthy volunteers for each of these two trials. And uh, that's why we have been able all together to get to the availability of safe vaccines to the general population. Great, and we've heard a lot about these vaccines in the news, um, but tell us, what are the COVID-19 vaccines and how are they administered? So both vaccines are very similar. They're based on what I uh, mentioned being referred to as the RNA technology, which has been studied for decades, but these are the first vaccine to be now available uh, to the population. And the RNA sends a genetic message to cells to make the important protein, which is called the spike protein. This is the protein that the coronavirus uses to enter cells. The RNA is very unstable and it has to be prepared in lipids to make it to the cell and deliver the message. But what, once it is in the cell and has done its job, it is rapidly destroyed by enzyme, so it does not stay around. And then the body starts to produce antibodies, which is going to be the protective measure against infection. As you mentioned, Julie, it is important to note that uh, this, these are not, they are not formally approved by the FDA. It's a, a temporary measure, an exceptional authorization to ensure that drug products like vaccines are accessible in those in needs during very special situations. And then um, finally, the, the trials continue and currently Pfizer and Moderna are continuing to accumulate information on the midterm and long-term safety and effectiveness of these vaccines. Both vaccines are administered the same way, two intramuscular injections, three or four weeks apart. Great, can you talk about some of the side effects of the vaccine? Indeed, um, these side effects are not so specific to the COVID vaccines. They, have, they were seen in a similar way with, for instance, the flu vaccine, and they include pain, you know, redness at the site of injection, also fatigue, headaches, muscle pain, uh, chills, joint pain, nausea, a little bit of malaise at times in the worst circumstances. These side effects must, might last several days and um, more individuals may experience these side effects after the second dose than after the first one. In some very rare circumstances, however, it's important to note that there are some rare allergic reactions, which are increased heart rate, lowered blood pressure, swollen lips, hives, and they have occurred in people with a history of allergic reactions. Um, they were detected during the monitoring period of these trials, and now it's important to uh, have the vaccine administered at sites that are equipped to treat these rare reactions. If a severe allergic reaction occurs after a first shot, a second shot is usually not recommended. So the big question everyone always wants to know, is one of the vaccines better than the other? don't have often simple answers in science, but this one is, uh, is one of them. The answer is no. Uh, both vac and both vaccines have been distributed across the U.S. in a similar fashion. Um, both have excellent efficacy results, 
around 90%, 95% efficiency, efficacy after uh, the second injections and rapidly after the second injection, one to two weeks after the second injections. And it lasts for several months, which by the way, has almost never been seen in vaccinology, such a high degree of protection. And it's important also to remember that the subjects, the volunteers in these trials will be followed for up to approximately 24 months. So as I mentioned earlier, there will be more information coming up about both the safety as well as the efficacy of these vaccines over time. There's one difference to remember, however, which is the transportation and the storage conditions. The Pfizer vaccine requires transportation at very cold temperature, minus 80 degrees Celsius, really cold, which requires special freezers. While the Moderna vaccine can be stored in regular freezers in hospital or clinic facilities. But when it comes to the general population, there's really no difference. Great, thank you. So someone who gets the vaccine, will they have complete protection from COVID-19? Nearly so. You know, both vaccines I mentioned conferred this 95% efficacy from protecting from the symptoms of infection. And it was comparable in these trials across subgroups by age, by gender, by race, ethnicity, or even underlying conditions. And severe cases requiring hospitalizations were avoided in vaccine recipients in both trials, which again, as I said, is really quite exceptional. We don't have that many vaccines with this kind of efficacy, so it's worth getting the shots. Great, thank you. That was a terrific um, overview of the vaccines. So now let's turn to talking about the questions that many pancreatic cancer patients have if they are a patient, you know, what they have concerns about getting the vaccine. So Dr. O'Reilly, are COVID-19 vaccines safe for people with pancreatic cancer? Yes, uh, we believe they are safe and we unquestionably recommend that uh, patients with cancer and patients on treatment receive vaccinations. And if I might uh, pick up on a couple of points that Dr. Duliesh uh, mentioned, that the vaccines that have been approved have been developed in healthy volunteers, right? So we're still learning what the immunity is in the setting of patients with, with cancer. And it'll be some time before we know this, but there's going to be a lot of data of emerging over this next three to six months on this. And a, a topical question for patients is, for those on active treatment, what's the best time to get vaccinated? Mm. And again, we don't have perfect data to, to guide us, but we believe these vaccines are safe. Probably best not given on the day of intravenous chemotherapy or when the blood count is at the lowest point. But for the most part, we do not recommend interrupting treatment uh, to receive vaccines. And hopefully they can be uh, integrated in parallel with care. And as we all know, this is a process that's an active scale up now and differing a little bit by states and uh, sort of comorbidity or underlying medical condition settings as to who has uh, direct access uh, to vaccines. So, so yes, I think patients with cancer have a higher risk of getting sick from COVID-19. So this is a very important group of people that we want to make sure are protected as optimally as possible. Great. And if a patient is actively getting cancer treatment and they get the vaccine, will the side effects potentially be different for that person? It's possible because immune systems are a little tampered for people undergoing treatment that they may not have as vigorous uh, an immune response and hence may not have uh, as much immediate discomfort uh, from the vaccine. But I think we've seen the whole spectrum so far from many people having nothing to a sore arm to low-grade fever to some swollen lymph nodes to the rare, rare uh, serious reactions. I will mention one other point because of the allergy question that Dr. Duliege brought up, and it's a 
it's a very common question from patients and families, particularly given that some have had experienced allergic reactions to, for example, oxaliplatin. Is it safe for them to get COVID-19 vac vaccination? And the answer is, we believe so. There are a couple of materials that are in these vaccines, uh, polyethylene glycol and something that cross-reacts with polysorbate that's part of some chemotherapy agents. So we'll take particular note for, for those groups, but they're small subsets of people. And as best we can tell, the, the safety looks, looks uh, I would say, very encouraging and, and favorable to date. Great. Um, so Dr. Merchant, what about a patient that is on a clinical trial? Can they get the COVID-19 vaccine? Yeah, so I think, you know, as Dr. O'Reilly said, in general, these vaccines are considered to be safe while patients are on treatment, uh, any cancer treatment. Um, I think it's a discussion that uh, each patient should have with uh, their particular oncologist uh, because it will depend on the timing uh, of when to give the vaccine, where they are in their treatment or where they are in their trial. Um, Obviously, if patients are immunocompromised or are getting certain uh, drugs that may uh, impact um, their immunity, it may be a discussion to have with the patient what the timing of the vaccine should be, um, any other drug interactions. But clearly, if patients are able to get the vaccine, they should definitely get it because cancer patients clearly are at higher risk uh, of susceptibility as well as having more adverse uh, effects to the uh, virus. And I think in most places right now, age is being used sort of as the factor to determine who can get um, the vaccine. But do you have any sense of when pancreatic cancer patients will be able to get the vaccine? Right. So currently, um, as you all know, the CDC has recommendations for the rollout of the vaccine. Um, the first stage, all the healthcare workers and most um, residents in long-term long -term care facilities have been vaccinated. Um, and now we're entering kind of phase 1B where um, frontline workers like police officers, firefighters um, uh, are kind of in that um, phase. And then also elderly um, people over the age of 75 um, that are uh, clearly at higher risk of having more adverse effects uh, with the virus. I think as the availability of the vaccines increases, um, again, each state will have different guidelines. For example, in the state of Florida right now, we're vaccinating people over the age of 65, not necessarily 75, whereas other states, the guidelines are still over the age of 75. And that's going to depend on the availability by each state in terms of um, uh, how much vaccine uh, they have available. But during this phase 1B uh, and phase 1C uh, will include people that are younger than have other um, chronic diseases and other comorbid conditions, uh, which put them at higher risk. And uh, that should be available. Hopefully, I would say, you know, within the next month or two, the next phase should roll out. But again, it's going to depend a lot on the availability of the vaccine. Great. So, Dr. O'Reilly, if a pancreatic cancer patient has already had COVID-19, should they still get the vac vaccination? Yes. So, thank you, uh, Judy. This is uh, another important question. And the current guidelines are yes uh, to this, that we, we wouldn't recommend vaccination during the acute phase uh, of the illness when a person has actively had symptoms. But once they're recovered or if they develop COVID-19 before immunity, has been generated after the first vaccine, uh, then we'll just wait till symptoms have resolved and, and vaccinate. There is some uh, perception out there that, that people need to wait and we want to actually change that uh, because it's not clear how, how durable immunity is from, a nat from an infection as opposed to vaccination. We don't know from vaccinations either, but the more people that are vaccinated, the less the chance for virus to spread, the less the chance for the variants that Dr. Merchant uh, mentioned to, to gain a foothold, and hopefully the greater protection in the community for patients, for families, and, and for uh, the entire uh, world, right? So, yeah, so recommendation is once symptoms have resolved, 
to be vaccinated. Great. So, you know, a real life scenario, a, a pancreatic cancer patient has been vaccinated and someone wants to come visit them who has not been vaccinated. Should they um, let that person visit them? Yeah. So, you know, this is um, it's a great question that's being asked um, everywhere now. But um, currently, the recommendations are still uh, that you should follow um, some of the precautionary guidelines. Um, while as a person who's been vaccinated, your risk of obtaining uh, the virus is decreased um, and you don't have the active disease, you can still be an asymptomatic carrier of the virus. So you could still be putting other people at risk. So even if um, you have been vaccinated and are going to have visitors, you should still follow the guidelines of wearing a mask uh, and keeping the social distancing uh, guidelines uh, still active. Um, and if, if you are going to, you should try to do it in an outdoor location where it's a much more ventilated area. But the same precautions still right now should be followed. Great. Yep. So we just need to continue to follow those guidelines we've been hearing all year long. Um, so we've gotten some questions in from our viewers. Um, so I'm going to turn to some of those questions. Dr. O'Reilly, um, should a patient pause or delay chemo or other treatments in order to get the vaccine first? And you, you touched on this, but maybe you can address it again. Yeah, thank you, Julie, and, and thanks for the question. So again, a very important one. So current, current guidelines are as far as possible to integrate vaccination directly with treatment and not to either delay treatment uh, for vaccination or vice versa. And so for people on active chemotherapy, for example, we'll just try to avoid when we think the blood count is at the lowest and perhaps try not to administer it on the same day of treatment just to minimize confounding side effects. It's good to touch base with your, your healthcare team on this. And as Dr. Merchant previously mentioned, just in the context of trials, there may be some specific guidance related to an individual study and the particular uh, agents that people are, are treating. So, but for the most part, it's, it's no interruption. Great. Um, another question from one of our viewers, um, Dr. Merchant, how does the COVID vaccine affect those who have had the Whipple surgery? So uh, again, it would depend on the timing of the surgery. Uh, obviously, if you've just had the surgery, um, you may want to wait to get the vaccine until you're kind of recovered fully uh, and have overcome some of the post-recovery uh, symptoms. Uh, however, if you've had the Whipple procedure for quite a while, it should not impact uh, you in any way whatsoever. Great. Um, Dr. O'Reilly, we, we touched on this, but this is a, a question from our viewer, and I think it's important to people to understand these real-life scenarios. So if the cancer patient and their family is vaccinated, can they have people over who are, who are also vaccinated? So slightly different question. And is social distancing acceptable inside the house with masks? if everyone is vaccinated? Yeah, so again, it's a, it's a great question. And, and right now, the, we still continue to follow the CDC guidance for uh, family members or friends that are outside of our immediate circle that we're not interacting with on a daily basis. So it's reassuring uh, that everybody's been vaccinated in that setting, but still the guidance is uh, masks and keeping our distance. What we don't know is people who've been vaccinated, whether or not they're uh, carriers uh, for the virus and the transmissibility, if they are carriers. So we still have a lot to learn in this setting. And I think over the coming uh, six months, we're, we'll have some very, I think, concrete uh, observations on, on these important points. But right now, it's still for the recommendations of social distancing, masks, <laughs> and minimizing our, our social circle. Great, and so Dr. Napoon, another question from um, our audience that's, that's similar. What are some of the best practices for patients and families who are unvaccinated? Um, so I hate to be repetitive, but uh, it's something that we've been hearing you know, over and over and over again on a daily basis. 
Uh, I do think that wearing masks is probably perhaps the most important thing you can do because there's no question that's going to decrease the risk of spread and even uh, protect you in terms of uh, getting the virus. Uh, but again, social distancing, uh, being outside, avoiding uh, poorly ventilated spaces, and really kind of avoiding crowds, um, you know, uh, that in and of itself should decrease the risk of spread um, and then following proper hand hygiene. Um, while the risk uh, now it appears that uh, it's much less likely to get it by contact surfaces and more, um, you know, respiratory spread, um, it should uh, be standard practice to perform good hand hygiene. Great. Um, and then Dr. O'Reilly, a last question from one of our viewers. Um, is one of the vaccines better for someone who is on active treatment? So which vaccine is better for those on active treatment? So we have two uh, under emergency use authorization in the US, the Pfizer BioNTech and the Moderna vaccine. They're both mRNA based. They're both non-live vaccines. They both, as Dr. Duliage uh, indicated for us have equivalent potency uh, in terms of what we know with regard to their protection against coronavirus. So the answer is there's no one better than the other. We, we may have in the near future one or two additional vaccines that uh, may receive authorization in the U.S., they look a little different, a little different in the technology, perhaps a little different in the protection. At the same time, all of these vaccines, as was brought up earlier so far, look, when we think about it, I mean, it's a phenomenal uh, effort that we're sitting here today, a year from the start of this, with something that can protect this disinfection. And uh, I think even if they were half as good, they would still have a, a value for, for, for us all. Great. Well, thank you. This has been a terrific discussion about COVID-19, pancreatic cancer, and the vaccine. I think sort of overall, the recommendation is that patients should get the vaccine, um, but everyone should continue to follow all of the guidelines, wearing a mask, uh, social distancing, washing our hands, um, and continuing you know, not to be in places where we're around a, a lot of people. So I just want to thank um, Dr. Dulidge, um, Dr. O'Reilly and Dr. Merchant for a terrific discussion. I want, also want to thank all of you, our viewers, for trusting PanCan to provide this critically important information to you. Once again, don't forget to call PanCan's patient services, open Monday through Friday from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. Pacific time. These services are available to you free of charge, and you can talk to a trained case manager to answer your questions and be informed so that you can make informed decisions about your care. Thank you everyone for joining us today for this important discussion. Please stay safe and be well. Thank you for joining us today. All production occurred in accordance with local, state, and federal guidelines to help slow the spread of COVID-19. If you still have a question, please contact Patient Services. From all of us at PanCan, please stay safe and be well.